Hi everyone, it's Kelly with Women For One, and today I am completely honored to be speaking with Chris Cade. Um, I came across Chris Cade because I've been on my spiritual journey for many, many years, as we all are, um, and I was just so intrigued by his words, and I felt such a resonance with um, our belief systems and what he teaches from such a grounded practical spiritual teaching so I'm just really excited to have this authentic conversation and I feel like our community will very much enjoy speaking with Chris listen I mean listening to Chris hearing what he has to say and I want to talk a little bit about who he is first and then we'll get into just this playful authentic conversation that has no uh, preconceived questions. We're just going to go for it. So Chris Cade, he considers himself a voracious seeker of the truth, which honestly, voracious is one of my favorite words ever. So that's amazing <laughs> to, to, to explore that word a little bit more. I'm really excited to talk to Chris. He's a second degree black belt and martial arts champion. Um, he has swum with wild dolphins. He's a, uh, He's tested software to find the bugs, which I love. He has such a wide variety of experience in his life and lives in the real world and also is very grounded in his spirituality. Um, his journey, which I'd like to speak with him a little bit more because at Women For One, that's what we do. He left a six-figure income and a corporate life and um, moved into more of his spiritual life and growth. And, has, and this has re rewarded this man with a network of spirituality and personal development websites. He's a graduate of the Monroe, Monroe Institute's Gateway Voyage Program and a student of the Diamond Approach. And I love that that he talks about he's a transformational consciousness leader and I know that's a lot of words and it comes out very big but I really believe that is what we need in this world more and more we need people that are leading us into seeking our truth and I'm very excited to be speaking to him today so thank you Chris for joining us thank you for having me I'm really looking forward to uh serving everybody who's listening and seeing what the mystery unfolds with us today. Absolutely. And I, I love your story and I love your truth. And, and, and we at Women for One, we're really committed to finding our truth and equally finding that space within ourselves to transform our lives and, and also take action where we need to for our lives and for the world. And just so you know, Chris, I love quotes. So I did find a few quotes that you that you've written, and it really I allow it to just imbibe quotes. And in Women for One, we have a lot of quotes on our site and on our social media. And what we do at Women for One is we encourage women to share their stories, and not from a place of staying in that and recycling that victimhood of what happened to them, but to share it to release those subconscious belief systems into moving into a place of finding their truth and taking action in their lives to move into a more peaceful and joyful place. So I, I want to start with this one where you said the shortest distance, well, you, you didn't say this, but you quoted it and I, it's one of my favorite quotes, the shortest distance between truth and a human being is a story and by Anthony DeMello, which is actually one of my favorite quotes as well. And I'd love to just start with that and talk about that, what, what your thoughts are on that. When we look at the way that we are, are raised, we actually understand stories before we understand language. We're actually observing the world and seeing how gravity works and how people respond to us. And from that, we derive what actions we need to do to survive, to get attention, love, all these kinds of things. And so if we really understand that we are actually learning stories, and that's the way we think before we have the language to communicate. We can also recognize that means there's a deeper truth in the way we internalize these stories, the way we view the world, more so than the words we use. The words are just, uh, they're signposts, they're pointers mm -hmm. that um, we can use to symbolize something that represent the story underneath it. You know, when we think about a cup, the, the letters C-U-P mean nothing. You can reverse the P-U-C, U-P-C. I mean, it doesn't matter what the letters are. Mm -hmm. There's a symbols, but the second we say, this is a cup, it has meaning to us because it has a story. It has a story in terms of what we drink out of it, whether we like cold cups, warm cups, 
you know, whether or not we like mugs versus glasses, whether or not we were smashed over the head with a, a cup when we were younger and it hurt us. I mean, we can have so many stories attached to what the cup is. And so when we're looking for the truth, what we want to look at is what is within that story? You know, because like I said, a cup can be anything to anyone, but it's, it has a unique meaning to each of us. Mm-hmm. And the same is true of every life story. When we have a trauma, a heartbreak, when we have success, when we have a new relationship, a breakup, it doesn't matter what it is, a new business. Um, what we want to look at is what's the story that, that was driving us to feel a certain way? Because the feeling isn't always what's happening now. It's often what happened in our past Mm-hmm. It's being mirrored and reflected back to us now, and we aren't always consciously aware of this. So if we dive in for the truth and say, what's the, the story? What's really true about this feeling right now? And is this feeling representative of who I am now and how I'm living and how I want to live? Or is it representative of who I was, how I lived, and the limitations I held in my life? We can start to see that the story itself is a channel by which we can find the truth and we can look back and say, oh no, this this fight that I'm having with my partner right now has really has nothing to do with them coming home late. It has to do with the fact that when I was a kid, every time my dad came home late, it was because he was cheating on my mom and then they got a divorce and I was abandoned and right. suddenly we realized all these feelings we have about betrayal and abandonment and disrespect because our current partner came home, it really has nothing to do with what is actually there. And so we just look for that truth, and then we can say, oh, my partner is not my father. My partner is not that person who abandoned me when I was young. Let me see the truth about who my partner is now in this moment. And we actually get a fresh new chance at the truth of this moment by using and channeling through the stories of our past and letting those go. Oh, okay. I love the way you just said that because I was in a healing school, an energy school for several years that worked really on the the transference part of um, my husband actually laughs at me all the time because I'm like, oh, you know what? I'm reacting in transference now. He uses it as a joke all the time with me. He's like, are you in transference right now, hon? (laughs) And, Uh And I feel like you know, you, you've got that transference place where where you you know you're you're witnessing how your reaction is really about something that has nothing to do with the present moment. Yet there's still you know it's percentages. There's still a lot of challenges on how do you incorporate you know and move out of that story and move into a place of choice and power around that transference to move forward with. The choices that you make, whether it be the relationship you were speaking about, you know, and in any way, that is what, you know, obviously I'm doing this work because I need to learn it. That is what my, my spiritual journey is about, is really making a conscious choice to move out of my story and move into conscious choice around what I do with my relationships and my own life and my relationship to my own life and the world. Well, for me, what I found is there's uh, two things that really come into play. One, you talked about it in the intro with me, is around software testing. And underneath that Mm -hmm. is a mindset that I bring to everything that I do. And the mindset is this. As a software tester, my job was really to do two things. One was to make sure that the software I was testing worked the way it was designed. So if a normal person came across this software, could they use it? Do the instructions work? And Mm -hmm. if they follow the instructions, do they get the expected result at the end? The second piece of it, my job was to break the software. And my job was to do as much as I could to use it in every wrong way possible to prove that the programmers had loopholes, that they missed things. Mm -hmm. And my job was to make sure that when this thing went out into the world, the average user wouldn't be able to break it by doing normal expected things as well as unexpected things. And so where that channels into spiritual development and particularly using stories to find the truth, you know, tying this back to where we started, Mm -hmm. is that when we look at our life, our mind is going to make stories about our current experience based on all of our previous experiences. So if we have a lifetime of betrayal, 
again, the first lens we will see our immediate experience through is through the lens of betrayal. Mm-hmm. We say, this person's betraying me. This is what's happening. And if we believe that to be true, we will keep repeating that pattern. We will find ways to sabotage ourselves, sabotage our relationships, and therefore get more people to betray us. And it just becomes a never-ending spiral downward. So where the software testing piece comes in is, I look at it and say, well, how about I look at the range of possible stories here? Okay, so the worst case scenario is, yes, this person is betraying me, and everything is horrible, and they mean to hurt me, and this is just someone I don't want in my life, and Mm -hmm. going to complete reactivity, negativity, and so on. I can also go to the extreme other side and say, what if this person is acting in 100% integrity? They want my absolute best interests. And the only reason I feel betrayed is because there's something about this situation I don't understand. There's some truth I don't understand. Now, reality is usually somewhere between those two extremes. But at least if I can hold the extreme of things that are totally broken and things that are totally perfect and right, it, it forces my mind out of the existing limiting story to say reality is one way. So you're talking about uh, opposites coexisting at the same time, really holding that space. Right. And, right. and acknowledging that neither one is necessarily true. Mm-hmm. It's just the viewpoint that we're holding in this moment. It's right. the story that we're telling ourselves. So by looking for what's realistic and eliminating all of the options that are just not likely, we start to see like, okay, maybe there's more to this moment than I understand. And then if we have enough presence, and this is the second piece that I wanted to go into, is not just looking at the stories, but having the presence to say, you know what, I'm not going to react immediately. I'm actually just going to be with this for a little while and see what's true. Mm -hmm. Take it in and, and really feel it out and see how it lands in my body. And from there, allow this opportunity for truth to unfold so that when I then engage whatever situation is, is conflicting in my life, I can then be curious what's true. Instead of assuming I know why someone did something, assuming what the story is, assuming the truth and taking on my old viewpoint, I can land and just be curious and say, you know what? When this experience came up and you heard, when, I, when this, you did this one thing to me, I don't know what was going on, but here's how I felt it. Right. I felt it as a betrayal, and I would love to know what your experience was. You know, and we're blessed if we have people where we have that safe, sacred space to be able to do that. But sometimes it can come up in a, a coworker situation where someone's like, you know, I totally didn't realize it and mean it that way. I'm sorry. I was rushed, or here's what I was thinking, and I didn't communicate it. You know, there's so many possibilities, and uh, I think it's easy to talk theory. And it's easy for people to listen and go, well, that's nice, Chris, you know, but what about the real world? So I'm going to bring this really home, and I'm going to be vulnerable about something that I haven't shared publicly because it happened two weeks ago. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And and that is that I recently went through a breakup. And in this breakup, there was a time period where um, I didn't have any communication uh, for about a day and a half. And under most circumstances, that's not really a big deal, right? I mean, so you don't talk to someone for a day and a half, like, really, whatever. Right. Um, But in my experience, I started feeling betrayal. I started feeling left behind, abandoned, rejected, isolated. I mean, I was in a real deep state of, of pain, of reactivity, of confusion, not really knowing what was going on. And I didn't understand it. I was like, this doesn't, you know, this is the software testing piece. This doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. Like, logically, reality is saying I didn't talk for a day and a half. My experience is saying this is the worst thing in the world. I need to get away from this. I don't want this. <laughs> Just give, give me someone. Please contact me. Please email me. Text me. Please make me feel better. Right. You know, I, I really felt that desire in me to have someone else make me feel better, to take away my pain. And instead of going that route, I just landed with it and kept staying with it for that day and a half. And finally, as I dug in, I realized that it was the, the pain of, in the past, I had been cheated on. Um, and the way it unfolded was that um, the woman I'd been living with at the time, she basically, you know, left for the weekend and came back. And it was roughly about a day and a half to two days of time. And during that time, I knew she was cheating on me. And so, you know, we, we did end up breaking.
separate camps, but that didn't last very long, and that was well before my spiritual journey, but there was this part of me that knew she was cheating on me. Mm -hmm. And so the whole weekend she was gone, I was feeling anxiety, pain, rejection, betrayal, all these emotions. And once I realized that that's what was going on, that this immediate moment that unconsciously was making me feel this way just because I hadn't heard from someone in a week and a half, or a day and a half, was just mirroring this old situation. I was like, oh, <laughs> these are two different people. I don't have to see my current partner as this old person. Right. And I just hear me uniquely and differently. And then what I did with that is I recognized this is my orientation. And in the past, my orientation was to react to lash out in anger, to try and make the other person feel bad, to try and um, basically make myself feel superior mm. so I wouldn't have to feel the pain of being cheated on. That was how I responded in the past. Mm. When I recognized that that was my old response and my old story, I then was empowered to come at it from a different place and say, hey, you know what? I would love to share with you what I've been going through. This has been my experience. And I recognize that you were just being yourself, that you didn't do anything, and that you showing up exactly as your perfect self is what triggered all of this in me. Mm -hmm. And now that I've had a chance to see it, I can see you more clearly as the person you are. And I thank you, thank you, for helping me see myself more clearly to let go of the stories of my past and to find the truth. Oh, that's, that's such a beautiful story on so many levels, because first of all, you, you made yourself vulnerable and imperfect. Like we all are, um, in understanding the, the life experience, because I feel like we all go through exactly that same experience. I've been there. I've had many friends that have been there and, and just to, to be able to pull yourself out as that witness and separate from what is happening and move into that empowerment of information from your past and stories, and then to also take action to learn and grow. I mean, that's really what our entire community is about. And also, you know, my life's journey is about. So right there, I am very honored. Thank you for sharing that. And on, on the same note, um, you know, I have a quote that it's really interesting because it, it, from you that you spoke about and you said real transformation occurs when you become totally willing to enter into that mystery, to walk into the darkness and the question marks and to see what emerges as you pass into the light. And if, and that's you, Chris Kane, and it feels like that's what you did there. You, you really walked that you moved into that space. Um, I love, I love the mystery of life. And I, I think it's really important for all of us to surrender to that. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that as well a little bit more. I appreciate you bringing that into this space because it really is the orientation from which I, I feel like I personally derive my power in life. It's not so much me consciously doing things, although conscious attention is extremely important to succeeding. And I apply conscious attention to all of what we're talking about, you know, finding the truth of the stories, letting go of the past. I mean, there's an mm -hmm. intense amount of attention and focus on truth in the present moment. However, the end of that is the mystery. At the end of that attention and focus is not me saying the world needs to conform to my ways or there should be a specific outcome. It's only to say that I'm diving into the truth. And out at the end of that will come what is real. And I think so much of our pain, and this ties into a lot of, you know, Buddhist philosophy comes from our attachments to how things should be, the expectation of the outcome. We, we put all of our energy in, and we expect the world to show up and respond in a certain way. And when it doesn't, we face pain. And that's because oftentimes we have illusions. We attach outcomes to our intentions. So I could say, look, I want to be in conscious, loving relationship. What's the pain that I've gotten to dig into in the last few weeks? The pain I have been exploring is lost stories, lost illusions, ideas of how I had attached future wonderful experiences to the person I was seeing. And mm -hmm. the mystery, the divine, is what is now allowing me to say, you know what? I'm still going to have those amazing experiences. I don't know who, with, or how that will unfold, because that's the mystery, that's the unknown. But clearly, reality has said it will not be with this person. Mm -hmm. So, if you keep fighting against reality, 
Mm-hmm. It won't make me feel better. It won't make my life any more enjoyable. So I can either let go of the illusion of these future ideas about how things should have been, could have been, would have been, mm-hmm. or I can stay attached and stuck to them. I, I tell you, <laughs> it's so true. Ideal, idealized images are are are, are the, the most challenging thing in my life and many of ours, I think. And that's what I call them is idealized images of how we want things to be or our future projections, right? Right. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think it's beautiful the way you said that. I really do. Um, and, and, you know, you speak about the truth, and uh, you know my whole journey in life is to get different people from all over the world leaders people that have been through a multitude of experiences on all different cultural levels um from all over the world to share their definition of authenticity and truth and i would love to hear what comes up for you when you hear those two words for me truth is Dissolving anything that's illusion. It's to to truly see the world accurately and to see myself accurately. And to do that, we always have to be in the unknown, in the mystery, because the world is changing, life is changing, we are changing. And if we hold on to fixed ideas about who we are, who other people are, even partners of 20, 30 years, and perhaps especially them, um, of the way the world is, we're not actually seeing accurately. We're not seeing truth because truth is always changing. Everything is changing. So in that light, truth for me is just always orienting towards seeing what is actually showing up and not letting my ideas about how things were, could be, or should be get in the way of me seeing what is. As far as authenticity goes, that for me is the outer expression of my inner state of being. So when I'm showing up authentically, people get that feeling of what you see is what you get. You know, I'm not hiding things. That doesn't mean I'm just revealing every single thing about my life story because that's not necessarily authentic. That could just be, for lack of a better word, psychological vomit. <laughs> yes. You know, there's, there's a tendency that people mistake openness with authenticity. Right. And I think that openness can be psychologically open. We can pour our whole life story out and never be authentic. And the reason why is because the authenticity is when our inner state of being, our inner values, our inner way of showing up in the world is reflected in the outer world. So someone could tell all their stories but be a different person inside and be like, well, that's just who I was. And, you know, that's not who I am. You know, the, the authenticity is this interview where I showed up and said, this is what I've been going through. Mm-hmm. This is how I show up in the world inside, and let me show you how I do that on the outside as well. So I think there's really an important distinction there between authenticity and openness that isn't always acknowledged. That's beautiful. Um, I've heard you speak around limiting beliefs before, and <clears throat> a question came up for me that I wanted to talk to you about. Our our community um, is very interesting how it's evolved over the past several years. We have a very large following in the Middle East, women in the Middle East. And these women have brought me to my into my heart and the experiences with them more than any other women I've experienced in my life from a place of power and education and choice. And my spirit and brain is having a a challenge in reconciling the fact that these women have been brought up with uh, not many high idealized images and not a lot of, you know, big belief systems about what they can achieve. Yet, they are so in their power, spiritually, emotionally, educated-wise, the women that I'm encountering, I just wanted... I guess more, I, I wanted some counseling on understanding why you think that might be. That's a great question. So I'm going to land in the mystery for a moment. Yeah. Uh, see, see where it lands with me. I'm, I'm, Sorry I'm, to just throw you one, but... No, I appreciate that. That's why I show up, is to serve and to, to be in that mystery, because I think that's where the true gifts and knowledge and wisdom is. And as I'm saying that, one thing that's coming to me is... The fewer beliefs we have in general, the more 
more opportunity there is to be in the mystery. You know, if we have a million and one beliefs about who we should be, shouldn't be, can be, can't be, then that's basically all these unconscious rules that are telling us how to show up in the world. Mm. And that takes so much energy and so much effort to try and figure out, like, how do you reconcile a thousand different rules to know what to do the right thing is? So what's coming up for me right now as you're sharing is that as these women have had less overall, you know, beliefs imposed upon them, that gives them a, a strength and a freedom when they see that a belief isn't holding true, they don't have 50 other beliefs trying to keep that one belief in place. They can actually look and go, is this belief true? Rather than are 50 beliefs true? So that's something that's coming up for me right now is it gives them the capacity to use their intellect to actually break apart some of the limiting beliefs that could be holding them back. That is awesome. And I never thought about it that way. I, I had this vision of like, you know, when birth, when you have something to push against, you actually gain strength from that and you can be very powerful. So there, that, rev, that revolution place, but I never thought of it like you have. And, and that's, that's actually makes a lot of sense to me in that way. Because I mean, I, when I talk to a, a typical Western woman, that's 45, a mom like me, uh, we've been brought up, and, and men too, to believe that these women are, quote, oppressed. And, and they are, you know, outwardly, yes. And But to, to speak with them and to have some, some of them on my team and to engage in authentic conversation has been life, it's been transforming for me because I've gotten to this place of we don't need to, quote, help them. We need to encourage an authentic conversation among all cultures to understand one another better and learn from each other. So then we can support one another because I've learned a lot from the way they make choices to deal with their lives and their relationships just by creating this dialogue. Yeah, I love that. It's so true that there is, there's a place within us that, that has a deep level of compassion for the human race and for the challenges people go through. And it can often be oriented towards wanting to fix the wrongs in the world. Mm -hmm. And that can come from two places. One, it can come from our inner critics that are really saying the world should not be this way. And therefore, it is my job to fix the world to make it the way I think that it should be. And that's where a lot of activism comes from. And that's why we see a lot of pain in activism. You know, I love that uh, Mother Teresa said, you know, I'm not going to march, you know, for, you know, for war or anything, but, you know, I will, you know, uh, march for peace, you know, and that orientation towards what allowed her to stay true to her values, similarly, is where we can find that place of compassion within ourselves to show up as our best selves, because when we show up as our best selves, our presence alone will impact people even without words. Mm -hmm. And when we do speak words, when we take action, it then becomes infused with the presence of who we are. And that impacts people much more powerfully than anything we can say or do from a reactive place. You know, that's a truly responsive place when we're coming from our own authentic power rather than giving away our power to all of the authorities or other people or the limiting beliefs. So I think it's really a, a valuable way of looking at the world that you're talking about there, that by providing support, inspiration, connection, presence, what we're really doing is we're saying, you know what? I can't fix your situation. It's not even my job to. But I can support you in showing up as the best damn version of yourself so that you can do the best with what you've got and let that spread like a spider web, like the butterfly effect. Right. From people to ripple to ripple. And it's very similar to what you're talking about one on one individually. It's the same thing on a larger scale. You know, it's it's that it's that lens we see the world through. When you talk about those activists, they're seeing the world through their own lens of what their future vision of the life is, and they're reacting from that place or their past experiences. Right? Is that what you're saying? Right, and we can't even know what's best for someone else. Right. So they they may be in a repressed situation 
which I, of course, would never wish upon anyone. I have great compassion and sympathy for that. And at the same time, we can't know what is in that person's highest good. We can only trust that if they are showing up as their best self and supported for that to show up as their best self, that what is in their highest good will naturally unfold through the unknown, through the mystery, through letting go of the ideas of what we think the world should look like, what they think it should look like, and let reality actually show what is real and what is needed. Absolutely. So you have on your website and what you do in your life from my understanding, and maybe you could talk about it a little more, you have several eBooks and courses and programs. Um, and the one that I was particularly drawn to for our community was about conscious chronicling and the ebook. And I feel like it's so great for us at women for one. And I, I wanted to know if you could talk about that and some other, other programs that you offer to move into a more conscious life. Yeah, the Conscious Chronicling Program, it really was the first thing I ever created and I've revised it over the years uh, as I've developed and as I've, I've gained more experience in the world. And what it really is, is a, it's an ebook that teaches you how to write short stories. And through this process of writing short stories, access an innate well of creativity. And from that space, you know, the, you know that's where creativity comes from, is the unknown. So it really is an opportunity to look at how to live more creatively and it uses writing as the, the channeling and the method for that. And that was really a gift for me when I had a lot of limiting beliefs about who I thought I was because I did not think I was a story writer. I failed that in, in school. I mean, I was clearly not a story writer. <laughs> and the, uh, the divine showed me as I stepped more into my spiritual path that I actually did have a talent and gift for writing stories that connected with people and, and helped support them in their development. And so once I figured out there was a process, an evolution by which I had deepened into and evolved, I then was able to reverse engineer that and, and create this conscious chronicling program to support people in that. So that's what it's really about at its core. And yet people have used it in ways beyond what I could have thought of, because as you and I talked about, stories are the shortest distance between us and truth. Mm -hmm. So when we understand and uncover stories, we gain the opportunity then to decide, okay, well, maybe I need a new story about how I'm going to step into a new business or right. step out of a, a divorce or step into a new relationship or whatever it happens to be. So in that light, understanding the creative you know, the creativity aspect of stories and how stories are kind of structured helps us look at our life more as that story and that narration and let go of old stories and step into new ones. Wonderful. And are there other programs that you'd like to share with our community after you've learned a little bit more about what we're doing here that you offer that we'd be interested in? Well, I'm a little biased in that I make everything from my own inner experience and what I find valuable, so I love everything that I make, <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to share that, and my, my real advice is not so much to take anything that I've said or you've said as, as being even carrying weight, right? and instead go look for the truth, so I would say just, you know, if someone's curious about my programs, just go read about my, my blog post, read some some of the free offers that I give away to introduce people to my programs, read about the programs, and, and see what resonates. Because sometimes one program may feel like, oh, that's the perfect thing for me. And then at the same time, there's one sentence describing other program, and we go, that sentence is calling to me. This is actually where I need to go. So I don't want to presume that I have any sense of what's in the best interest of people listening and instead just have everyone trust their inner guidance. Is it, and you know, true. you just said, okay, you just did two things here. First, my next question was, I always ask people, what are, what's one piece of advice you have for a community? So you just gave that advice. And I love that because I, first of all, love hearing how people stepped into a conscious place on their spiritual path in their life, like what resonated with them. And when I read about yours, I was like, wow, there's so many things that resonate, so many belief systems and, and quotes and writings that Chris talks about that is so aligned with what I believe, yet my path was so 
different. I mean, I started with Eileen Caddy when I was 17 in the Finhorn Foundation, then I moved to Shirley MacLaine, and then I lived with a guru. I mean, I just went boom, but you know, I, I did everything, yet it's it's set me into the same truths that you have, but I agree. People need to find what resonates with them. I mean, it's so powerful to say that. It is, and it's really important that people recognize that. And this is where the, the mystery and the unknown is of such an incredible source of, of power. I mean, true, authentic, deep power. Because when we recognize that we are all different, we all have unique paths, and that what supports us is going to uniquely be different than what supports another person. We then can dive into that power, into that moment of truth and say, okay, what is it that really calls to me? Because it doesn't matter what path we take if we are orienting towards truth and presence. Right. It's totally the path, like you said, does not matter because the mystery and the unknown will reveal to us what we most need in any given moment, whether it is that guru, whether it is a program, whether it's silence, whether it's, as much as I don't wish it upon anybody, trauma and hardship. It can right. be any of these things that are the ultimate path that we need in this moment to discover our truth, to step into more power. So I, I really love that you, you called that out, that it really is every different path is equally valid and equally supported and it's so easy to get caught up in assuming we should do things the way a certain expert says we should or the way our even our own guru or teacher says you should do it this way when the reality is they're coming from their experience and it may be vast experience and they may be right it may not be right for what we need so we need to take that in and say okay maybe that's right maybe it's not let me give it a try if that resonates Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it made me think of one more thing. It's so interesting. When when I, because I had a guru for several years, and many years actually, and I started this new program, I was with this very dear friend, very wise, who um, has since passed. But sh I remember leaving the first couple times we were in this program. And the woman that was leading it, I completely disagreed with her on 50% of what she said. And I completely resonated with her on the other 50% she said. And I looked at my friend, and I was like, Oh my gosh, like, I can't go back there. Did you hear what she said? That, that was awful. And she said, Well, what did you agree with? And what you what didn't you and I said, Well, I agree with 50%. She goes, Kelly, that's discernment, just discern what you want, imbibe it and allow the other to just pass through you. It, you don't need to it, take it on and agree with 100%. And it just made, it reminded, when you were speaking, it reminded me of that that story that really resonated with me. And now I, I've strengthened my discernment when I hear people speak and teachers, where if it resonates with me, I, I imbibe it into my cells. If it doesn't, I allow it to go. I love that. And that's exactly what people need to do in their lives because we're going to receive inspiration, support, guidance from every direction in life. And the more we open up to the mystery and the unknown, the more that will come from our entire experience rather than just certain ways in which we expect to receive guidance and support. So by having that openness, we also have a greater requirement and need for that level of discernment you're talking about, the craft and nuggets of truth that really work follow those clues and let go of what doesn't or let it just sit you know there's been times in my life where someone gave me advice and I thought <laughs> that is so off base that is so not accurate <laughs> and then years later I go that person was so right <laughs> and they knew exactly what I needed and I did not listen <laughs> but it was it, that seed had been planted such that years later I could recognize the truth in it and then discern again based on my new level of awareness because the more that we develop, the more that we discern, the greater that capacity becomes and the more refined it is. So that, you know, in the beginning we may be trying to split hairs over, you know, one particular idea, you know, true, not true, and understand it. But as we deepen into our capacity, we can follow down multiple threads. So it may not just be yes or no, it could be a yes followed by 10 more options off the yes that we then can discern and explore. So it really is valuable to, to recognize both the importance of separating the message from the messenger, find 
what we really, really need at the moment and allow anybody to be our messenger. And then at the same time, keep refining that level of discernment. The more we develop, the more we can question even our old ideas and beliefs because we're changing. Right, and we don't have to ju- we don't have to judge the people for their perception or their advice as well, right? <laughs> you just that's what I used to do. What are they crazy? Yeah, <laughs> and that blocks us off from the possibility that there's brilliance somewhere within what they're sharing. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I just am so honored to have spoken with you. I could speak to you for another two hours about all this, but I really thank you so much for speaking to our community and I wish you well. And if, if any of our community want to look at what Chris is doing and access his information, it's at chriskade.com, which I'll have up on our site when we post this interview. And I'm just so honored to have spoken with you, Chris. Thank you for your time. It's been a gift to serve you and and everybody listening and um, I wish everybody well. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Kelly. Take care. Bye.